Hello, I'm Graham Saunders and I'm the president of Environment North. Uh, this organization is concerned about environmental issues in northwestern Ontario. In 2021, we had our first general meeting via Zoom. Our invited guest speaker was Dr. Gordon Edwards, who has expertise in nuclear issues and nuclear waste disposal in Canada. The uh, Nuclear Waste Management Organization is proposing to dispose of nuclear waste in northwestern Ontario, uh, near Ignace. What follows is the first part of his Zoom presentation at that meeting. Now I graduated from University of Toronto, as Graham mentioned, in 1960 with a gold medal in mathematics and physics. And I even thought at that time of specializing in nuclear science because it is such a fascinating subject. But I had never heard of these radioactive wastes and neither had the decision makers who approved the construction of 20 nuclear power plants at Pickering, Bruce and Darlington, as well as a couple more in Quebec and New Brunswick. So nuclear energy was sold to the public under false pretenses, claiming that it is inherently safe, when in fact it uh, inherently clean, when in fact it produces the deadliest industrial waste ever seen. The nuclear industry is the only industry that actually creates hundreds of brand new elements that are deadly poisons because they are radioactive, which means the atoms are unstable in their nucleus. A radioactive atom is like a miniature time bomb. Sooner or later, it will explode or disintegrate, giving off one or two damaging projectiles which break molecules, including DNA molecules, thereby creating a host of diseases, cancers of all varieties, damage to reproductive cells like eggs and sperm, an impaired immune system, and even reduced intelligence in, in unborn children exposed in utero. When India exploded its first atomic bomb in 1974 using plutonium produced in a Canadian nuclear reactor that was given to them as a gift, it shocked everybody. One year later in 1975, sensational stories emerged about hundreds of homes and schools in Port Hope, Ontario being radioactively contaminated. St. Mary's Elementary School was evacuated when the radon levels in the cafeteria were found to be higher than those allowed in uranium mines. Huge volumes of so-called low-level radioactive waste had been widely dispersed throughout the town from a federal crown corporation, El Dorado Nuclear Limited. And now $1.2 billion is being spent in the most expensive and most extensive municipal environmental cleanup in Canadian history in Port Hope. They're putting 2 million cubic meters of radioactive waste into gigantic mounds seven stories high, each one covering about 14 hectares of land. Now, people had been assured that nuclear power in general is clean, safe, and peaceful. Well, it turns out that none of these adjectives is perfectly true. It is clean only if you ignore the waste or bury it in some out-of-the-way place like Northern Ontario. It is peaceful as long as someone doesn't access the plutonium and use it to make atomic bombs. And it is safe as long as workers and managers are not careless as at Port Hope, no major accidents happen as at Chernobyl, no total lack of electrical power occurs as at Fukushima, and no act of armed aggression takes place. In 1976, a British Royal Commission report pointed out that large parts of Europe would be uninhabitable today if nuclear power had been widely deployed in Europe prior to World War II just because of the conventional warfare bombings and sabotage that took place during that period. That British report also warned against reprocessing technology to extract plutonium from used nuclear fuel, and even concluded that, quote, we should not rely for energy supply on a technology that produces such a dangerous substance as plutonium unless there is no alternative, end of quote. It was not until 1977 that the government of Canada actually officially acknowledged for the first time the high-level radioactive waste problem in a document entitled Managing Canada's Nuclear Waste, in which a deep geological repository was first proposed. In 1978, a year later, an Ontario Royal Commission issued a report entitled The Race Against Time that called attention to the staggering nature of the nuclear waste problem 
and said that there should be a moratorium on any new nuclear reactors unless the problem can be solved, hopefully by 1985. The nuclear industry, having hidden the truth about nuclear waste for 30 years, was now revealed uh, as having hidden a dirty secret. Nuclear proponents defended themselves by saying in many public forums that they had a solution in mind. All we have to do, they said, is bury it in an undisturbed geological formation, abandon it there, and forget it. They said, in fact, many times, nuclear waste is not really a technical problem, but only a public relations problem. Now, think about that for a moment. It says a lot about the industry's manner of thinking. For them, it is indeed mainly a public relations problem because it prevents them from expanding or even surviving as an industry. In July of 1978, the governments of Canada and Ontario launched a $700 million research project in nuclear waste, including an underground research laboratory in Manitoba, to validate the DGR concept that had been put forward by Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. After a 10-year environmental assessment process had been concluded with public hearings in five provinces, the Seaborne panel concluded that the DGR concept was not ready for implementation, that site selection should not take place, and that a radioactive waste agency should be created that is completely independent of the nuclear industry, reporting to Parliament frequently and with multiple stakeholders represented on its board of directors. Instead, the Kretzian government authorized the nuclear waste producers, Ontario Hydro, now known as OPG, Hydro-Quebec, and New Brunswick Power, to form an industry-owned corporation, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, to consult Canadians and recommend a solution to the nuclear waste problem for irradiated nuclear fuel. Well, of course, the industry was already on record that the DGR was their chosen so solution, after three years, the NWMO was given the go-ahead to search for a willing host community that would be agreeable to accepting all of Canada's irradiated nuclear fuel to be transported to one site near that community and buried there forever. Beginning 10 years ago, with 22 initial candidate communities, NWMO has now narrowed the search down to two candidates, one being the town of Ignace, or more precisely, a site in the Rebel Lake area between Ignace and Wabagoon. The candidate communities have been wined and dined and taken on tours of nuclear facilities, all expenses paid, and have been showered with money, millions of dollars, just to remain willing to listen to NWMO representatives explain in elaborate detail how good the plans are and how safe it all is. There seems to be little difficulty for people to believe that the nuclear wastes are far too dangerous to be left where they are, near the reactors that produce them, yet those wastes will be entirely safe once they are at a site that has been fancifully attached to a willing host community. Despite monthly meetings over many years, NWMO expends very little effort in explaining to the Citizens Liaison Committee some of the most important things that they should know as more immediately affecting their communities, such as when the irradiated nuclear fuel arrives at the site, the site for the DGR, the individual highly radioactive fuel bundles will have to be removed from their shipping containers one at a time and manipulated in specially constructed hot cells behind leaded glass windows six feet thick using robotic arms to insert those fragile bundles into smaller copper and steel burial containers. The trouble is that any damage to the metallic sheath of the fuel bundles during handling will allow radioactive gases and vapors to escape from the fuel bundles with a risk that some of those fugitive emissions may find their way into the local environment. And once the irradiated fuel has been concentrated in one spot, there will very likely be strong pressure to generate some revenue to offset the $23 billion expenditure associated with the waste disposal program by either importing nuclear waste from other countries as charging a fee, as uh, Jean Chrétien has been secretly plotting with his clients for the last several years, as came to light recently, or to reprocess the irradiated fuel to extract plutonium for its value as a nuclear fuel. Now, reprocessing used can-do fuel, as is now being proposed in New Brunswick by Moltex Corporation with the cooperation of Canadian nuclear laboratories, is something that would have a great impact on whatever community is a willing host community. They should be fully 
fully alerted to uh, this possibility and to the details of what it all means. It will likely make that portion of Northern Ontario a very contaminated site, joining the ranks of other reprocessing sites that are already known. And also, if the NWMO or the Government of Canada or the nuclear industry, for whatever reason, decides not to build a DGR as proposed, then Northern Ontario may become a parking lot for irradiated nuclear fuel stored on a surface for centuries to come. So in recent days, a new organization, as one of the founders, it's a Northern Ontario Alliance of Indigenous and Non-Indigenous Volunteers and Organizations. It has emerged in Northern Ontario. It's called We the Nuclear Free North. Already information from this new alliance has been distributed to about 30,000 households, farms, and businesses from Uppsala to the Manitoba border, with key concerns and information detailed in the literature. We the Nuclear Free North has identified three main concerns. First, the issue of informed consent or willingness. How is consent to be defined? What level of consent is needed? Who is entitled to have a say in granting or withholding consent? And how is consent to be determined? Secondly, lack of scientific evidence for safety of burial and abandonment in a DGR. Can we afford to experiment with future generations? Mistakes could contaminate potentially our waterways and food chain for thousands of years. And number three, the danger of transportation and repackaging of irradiated nuclear fuel over a period of many decades. Dangerous waste will be transported up to 2,500 kilometers along some of the most accident-prone roads in the country, radioactive gases, vapors, and dust, if released, can accumulate in the environment from handling damaged and fragile fuel. Um, the uh, organization says, we believe that responsible stewardship of the waste close to the sites where they are produced is the best management alternative for the foreseeable future. I hope you found this uh, presentation informative. Uh, as Gordon Edwards has pointed out, uh, nuclear energy and waste disposal have many more complications. You can also learn more about this critical issue of nuclear waste by visiting our website, uh, environmentnorth.ca, or the recently formed coalition, uh, Nuclear Free North. Thank you for watching. <laughs>